Good morning. How's everyone feeling? Is it just me, or does DEF CON consistently get more energetic and more awesome every single friggin' year? <laughs> like, I know many of us think we're slowing down, and we keep saying we're the old crowd and we're not kids anymore, and yet every one of those people who's older than me and just always thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know how I'm going to handle DEF CON this year, that's the person I see at like 3 a.m. still at the ninja party with a drink in each hand and one tape to their crotch. So welcome, welcome, yes, this is Boomstick Foo. We did a little something like this at ShmooCon and it went over pretty well. So we're gonna try it here with what's probably an even more firearm receptive audience. <laughs> Let's start off very quickly. What we're gonna do is blast through some slides very fast to get everyone kind of up to speed. If you're not a real veteran of weapons, you're not going to be after these slides, but you're going to know enough to have some sense about some things. And we're going to try to pepper all your minds with questions, because this is all about the Q&A. We want to hear what you want to know, and I want my esteemed panelists to be able to give you all the information you crave. So starting out, how many people are gun owners? Woo! All right. How many of you shoot regularly? Almost all the same hands. I like that. How many of you have ever had to use a firearm defensively? Present or pull the trigger, let's say. Okay. And how many of you are considering a purchase of a piece of steel? Maybe you want another one. Maybe it's your first one. How many people want to just always buy them? Okay. <laughs> That's the reason I don't have any tattoos, by the way, because the two addictive things in life I've heard are firearms and tattoos, yeah. and I have a six-month rule that I give myself. So every six months, I'm going to buy one, and I keep friggin' choosing guns. I hear, I hear crack's pretty addictive, too. <laughs> yes. All right. Of those people considering a purchase, how many are considering their first purchase, possibly? All right. We hope to give you some lot of good knowledge on this. What this talk is going to be about, it's going to be about defensive firearm ownership. It's not going to be about storming ahead, you know, into the brigades and the breach. It's going to be all about staying within the law, keeping your hardware legal, keeping yourself legal, keeping out of trouble. Speaking of staying out of trouble and out of problems, let's cover the four rules of firearm safety, which everyone should know. First of all, you always, always, always treat a weapon as though it is loaded, even if you are sure it is not. You always keep the weapon pointed in a safe direction, never where you wouldn't want to fire. You always are aware of your target and what is beyond it. People often forget that one. And last but not least, your finger is always off the trigger until you're ready to shoot. So what's wrong with this picture here? They stopped serving breakfast yes. at 10.55. Besides the fact that Michael Douglas is illegally brandishing a fully modified automatic Intratec in a fast food restaurant, you know, he's got his finger on the trigger, exactly. And anyone who's seen knows what happens. He puts some rounds through the ceiling. Keeping your finger off the trigger is very, very important. Every accident I've ever seen has been with somebody who was holding a weapon with their finger on the trigger for no earthly purpose. Yeah. Guns don't just go off. Yeah. You have to tell them to. So why, why choose to own guns in the first place? That's one of the questions a lot of you know, anti-gun people will often ask you. It's not about bad neighborhoods. It's not about, oh my god, I'm going to be a victim and I have to stand up. I mean, it's partly that, but it's not like you're living in fear. That's not why we own guns. You hope for the best life you can ever have, but you have to be prepared, I believe, and most of us believe, for those unforeseen horrible circumstances. And the worst circumstances can get pretty bad in an unforeseen way. Think about what would happen if you lived somewhere where there was just a mass civil unrest or the riots after the floods or an earthquake. These are things that even in a nice, perfect, safe community, Community, you may face one day, you may face a breakdown in order. And even when order is not fully broken down, what is the cop's responsibility to you in society? Have no legal None. The cops do not have a legal obligation to prevent crime and prevent violence against you. They respond to it. And that and has been backed up by the Supreme Court yes, and is. numerous state level cases. Uh, the police are, their job is to respond to crime after it has happened. Mm -hmm. It's not their job to proactively protect you, and they're not under any legal obligation to do so, except under rare circumstances where you are under police custody, such as maybe like a, an informant that's pending to go to trial. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, if you are just the average citizen and you say, hey, there's a guy at my front door with a gun, he's kicking it in, and the cops don't get there in time, yeah, they're not, not their fault. They're not obligated. So what are we going to discuss? 
<laughs> yes, yes. Well, this isn't really about hunting. Hunting is its own separate category. You know, that's, that's also, a lot of people latch on to that. They say, well, of course I support gun ownership. I'm a sportsman. It's not necessarily about sport. It's about much more than that. You don't want to get bogged down in that argument. So what... The Second Amendment does not say hunting in it. Yes, the Second Amendment does not say game animals. We're going to talk about weapons, we're going to talk about ammo, we're going to talk about keeping yourself up to speed, we're going to talk about what you have to have in your head, we're also going to keep you as safe and legally, you know, out of jail as we can. Quickly, weaponry. Three types of weapons, most of you should know this, there are rifles, there are shotguns, there are handguns. If you're talking defensively, rifles are basically off the list. You're not defending a huge patch of land from a platoon of hostiles, you're a guy, you know, standing in your living room. Shotguns and handguns are really what it boils down to in a defensive weapon situation, and there's a lot we can say about each. Be aware, there's different actions and styles. Many of you may know, but for those who don't, shotguns can be pump or auto-loading. Don't even discount the old-fashioned, you know, double barrel, nice little hammer gun, something you can keep ready all the time. We call that the get-off-my-porch shotgun. Absolutely. <laughs> If you don't have any weapons at all, if you're literally just saying, hmm, I think I would like to buy a weapon for defense one day, the same thing we tell everyone, everyone. For your first one, if you don't have any special needs, Remington 870 or the Mossberg 590 family. Most reliable shotguns ever. We gotta hold, hold, I'm sorry, hold questions. We're gonna kick through these real fast. There's so many ways you can customize, you can work out some accessories to your shotgun, you can put a light on it, you can, you know, size saddle the shells, you can sling it. Don't modify your guns too much, we'll tell you why, but you know, there's a lot of options there. Handguns, you should just know a pistol is not a revolver. You should understand the distinction. If you don't, you know, we'll explain it to you further. Just don't be afraid to ask. And there's benefits and you know, the pros and cons of each. Revolvers are very reliable. They're not going to jam. They're very simple. If you're not comfortable with weapon technology, you'll be able to handle it. You can also store it ready. You can have you know, no spring pressure whatsoever. You can leave it stored for as long as you like. A pistol, however, an auto-loading pistol is going to give you more rounds. It's going to give you faster reloads. But you may not be able to store that in a drawer forever at the ready because you've got springs compressed, particularly in the magazine. Speaking of keeping things safe and ready, always keep maintenance in mind. You're never just going to buy something and throw it literally in a drawer forever. You want to make sure it's clean. You want to make sure it's taken care of. You want to clean it after you shoot every time. Ammunition. I want you to guys to ask a lot of questions of my panelists about this one. Ammunition is the second biggest consideration other than the actual make and model of what you're going to use. Ammunition should be you know, thought of essentially not too big and not too small if you're going to be shooting a handgun. Something too small is not going to do the job you need it to do. Something too big is going to make a you know, big boom, but you know, it's overkill. You don't need a 454 Casul to defend your house. Oh, it would be fun. Shotguns, I can give you a whole host of crazy statistics, but it boils down to get a 12 gauge. There's ammo for it out the ass. There's so many different versatile ways of loading them and handling them. It's the cheapest, it's the easiest. The patterning and crush cavity you don't even need to know about. Think about and please ask us about preventing over penetration. Just because ball ammo is cheap and you shoot it at the range doesn't mean you just use full metal jackets at you know defensive situation. You want to prevent going through walls. You want to prevent going through one person and hitting the person behind them. You also want to avoid legal trouble, however, which can be presented with really crazy ammo. Noid's going to tell you about that. Also consider, just because we're talking about lethal technologies, you should never think lethality as an exclusive path of action. Less than lethal solutions are good to be familiar with, they're good to have available to you. They protect not only the assailant, not like that's your main consideration, but it's, you never want to take life if you don't have to, but they also protect you. They protect your well-being, they protect your family. If it's your you know, drunk uncle who staggered in your house at two in the morning, maybe it's better to pepper spray him instead of just start blasting away. <laughs> And God forbid you ever actually have to escalate a situation to a lethal level. If you had already applied less than lethal force, it's a very, very big legal concern. You took every step you could to prevent harm. Don't just leave your weapon stored, as we say. Always just find a good range. The ranges are always easy to find. You can definitely find a good one near you. Find out what you're allowed to do there. You know, don't just, you know, pop, pop, pop at the target. Find out if you can draw from a holster or not. Find out if you can tactical reload. Find out if you can do rapid fire. Talk to the people around you. Ask what courses maybe they've taken. There's a lot of defensive shooting courses. Ask my panelists about those. Even if you're practicing, Consider, you're not just practicing with your lethal ammo, by the way. If you have pe how many people have pepper spray? 
How many people have ever actually used it just to see what it would do? Just like on the, on a, outside somewhere. If you, you know, it just makes as much sense as not owning a, you know, a gun and never practicing. See what kind of stream comes out of that. Is it going to be a nice ballistic stream or is it going to get caught by the wind and blow back in your face? Is it going to be able to be aimed at a distance or not? Put one or two pumps off. You know, they only cost a couple of bucks, those little canisters. Practice with them too. Yes. Um, another really good thing for a woman to carry as a, a non-lethal weapon is a telescoping baton. Um, it's something you can carry in your purse, in your pocket, and, and just pull it out and whack whoever. It, it's, a, it's a nice deterrent, too. You, you sit in it. Whack off. whoever. Um, <laughs> yes. True. Yeah. As we mentioned, but just blunt the, weapons are... Hand strap, you know. So it's not easily taken away from you. Mm -hmm. But blunt sure weapons can be, yeah, yeah, legality is a much bigger issue. Note, we're kind of talking, yeah. pepper spray is usually very legal, stun guns not often as legal, and blunt swinging weapons can often get you into legal hassle. There are many psychological considerations, not just the psychology of not looking like a victim, but actually the psychology of what would happen if you actually had to take a life. It's not something just to gloss over. It's something you need to think about for yourself when you make a determination whether or not you could ever use a weapon defensively. A CCW, obviously, a concealed carry permit, if you're carrying your weapon on the streets, not just in your home or business, is going to increase the stakes. It's going to maybe, if you have the wrong personality, you might get twitchy. You might say, oh my gosh, am I, am I always on the lookout for crime because now I've got my gun on me? Think about what's going on in your mind. Brief legal notes. Always, this really boils down to always follow the law. Do not skirt the law just because you don't like the law. Plenty of, I think all of us up here hate most of the gun laws that are out there with good reason, but you gotta friggin' follow them. You can wind up in so much shit if you don't. Not just in the sense of a slap on the wrist prosecution. We're talking hard time, vindictive DAs, maybe not just losing the weapon you were carrying where you weren't supposed to, but losing your whole collection, losing your rights to purchase future weapons. Always, always be aware of the law. And Thorne, I think, in a minute is gonna tell you about what you need to be aware of legally, and Jurist will tell you as well, if you ever actually have to fire. Yeah, give you an idea. Federal gun law, um, like illegal possession of an unregistered machine gun, mandatory 10 years in federal pound me in the ass prison. <laughs> and that's on top of whatever state laws you might have broken. So you might get out 10 years later only to go back and then have to do your state time on top of it. Uh, they definitely don't do the slap on the wrist thing when it comes to guns. Yes. One last time. Four rules of firearm safety. Let me hear them. You always treat weapons how? Always treat as they're loaded. You always make sure you're pointing where? Never where you wouldn't want to fire. You always be aware of what? Be your target and beyond it. And you always keep your finger where? Off the trigger. Exactly. That's all it is for me. I thank you. Here's my esteemed panel. So are you going to MC this thing, take questions? Or? Yeah, I guess we can. Can we get, a, can we get an introduction of who we all are? Uh, hi, I'm Noid. I'm the director of physical security for DEF CON. Um, also a big fan of guns. Got a lot of them. Um, I was asked to be on this panel because I have done, I've been into guns for a long time. I do a lot of training. In fact, I've worked as a range officer supervising law enforcement training before. Um, been a, done hunting, that kind of thing. Um, I'm also pretty rabid about this country's gun laws and why they're wrong and why they don't work and how attacking law-abiding citizens is not the solution when you're trying to attack criminals. So I was asked to be up here because of my knowledge of guns and my whatever. Thank you, Noid. Thank you. <laughs> and Mouse. And I'm dead sexy. Mouse, our female perspective. Yeah. Um, I'm Mouse. I'm a grad student. Um, I've grown up with weapons and. Um, have a rather fondness of them and I've been asked to provide a female perspective on personal safety. Thank you and our law enforcement voice. Hi, I'm uh, Thorne. I uh, did 20 years law enforcement. Uh, I've been in a couple of uh, shooting situations. Uh, last five years of my career I was uh, doing uh, major crime scene investigations. Um, seen a lot of people shot so I, I know both sides of what happens with this stuff. And from putting the cuffs on to keeping them off, Jurist, our lawyer. So, uh, I'm Jurist. I'm an attorney in uh, the state of Missouri. I'm not your attorney. Sorry, I've got to give the uh, disclaimer. Um, I'm not your attorney. Nothing that I say should be considered as legal advice. And um, 
nothing I should say should uh, be construed to create a legal relationship. Um, I'm also a uh, firearms enthusiast, and um, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm what happens after things uh, go very pear-shaped. So. All right. I don't know if we have any crowd mics, or you just want us to repeat the questions. But stand and uh, stand and be recognized if you'd like to ask something. Please. This is all. This is the rest of the talk is all you. We got 45 minutes for whatever you want to know. Yes. Okay, the question was about uh, improvised weapons, like let's say using a nice heavy mag light as a, you know, a defensive club, as it were. Well, yeah. It, <laughs> it's not easily concealable in a purse, though. <laughs> yeah, it's also, at the same time, though, um, one advantage to that is I've worked security before, and one thing you do get out of that is whenever you bring a weapon into play, you escalate a situation. And the nice thing with weapons that don't necessarily look like them, such as the five cell mag light, is the fact that you can have it on you, it's available, but just by having it, you have not increased the hostility in this particular situation. Who else? Yes, sir. Uh, what about non ammunition for the option? The question was for less than lethal, it's, it's important we always say less than lethal ammunition because it can sometimes be lethal. But um, yes, there's, there's plenty of options there. Would anyone like to, I know I have some thoughts on that, but anyone else as well? Yeah, I uh, used pepper spray a couple of times out on the streets when I was in uniform. And I'll tell you, that stuff takes the fight out of people like amazingly quickly. You can have like a huge guy ready to take you on. I'm not that big, I mean, I'm 5'10". He's talking rubber buckshot, you know, plastic bullets. Okay, plastic, plastic bullets, um, that stuff does not work generally out on the streets, those types of, of bullets. Um, you can use them for crowd control and they're very uh, controlled circumstances, but it's tough to do it right. So, Yeah, a lot of my friends disagree with me, but um, for my home defense shotgun, I load it up with what I'll call a graduated tube. I keep it ready, not loaded, but I keep a rack of rounds right next to it, and they're basically all just police buckshot, but two rubber buckshot topper rounds. So if I load the tube up, I top the tube off with the two less than lethal rounds, which are the first ones that cycle through. I can therefore, it's more, honestly, it's more for my protection and my own psychological consideration than anyone who may be assaulting my family or myself. I would have much, much less regret pulling the trigger in the heat of the moment, knowing that the first couple rounds are going to be a hornet's nest as opposed to lead. But once you've broken that barrier, once you've already, you know, fired away, stung the hell out of someone, knocked them over, and they're still very much behaving improperly, I would have no regrets at that point cycling through the rest of the tube. The question was, can you get them for pistols? Yes, but there is a very big consideration in that something like an auto-loading pistol is probably not going to cycle properly with the uh, less than lethal round. It's not going to have the appropriate back pressure to, to operate the slide. So in a revolver, yes, it's possible, but be very aware which way your cylinder is rotating in the revolver. You're making sure you're, you're pulling the first one out that you expect. Um, and also, like an auto-loading shotgun would be the same thing. You're probably not going to cycle an auto-loader fully. But a pump shotgun, you're not going to have that kind of a concern. I saw a hand here, but this well, is Well, actually, also to add on to that, too, also realize that less than lethal, um, things like rubber bullets and stuff uh, can kill somebody. Mm -hmm. So there was that gal, I believe it was up in Seattle about a year ago, who got shot in the head by a cop with a rubber bullet, and it killed her dead. Um, so be aware that if, even if you've, you've presented a weapon, you're possibly going to have to use force. Realize that even your non-lethal or your less than lethal first couple of rounds may end up having that effect. So it's something to take into consideration. And even though more, they're more expensive, practice with a few rounds of them as well, especially in a shotgun. See, they're going to pattern a lot differently than your other rounds will. There was a hand, I'm sorry, there's one hand behind you, then we'll get you. Yes, sir. So, so choke and all different shotgun rounds and loads. Well, when it comes to, you know, the type of engagement where, you know, say you're in your house and you got to potentially shoot somebody breaking in, um, everything from number seven bird shot and up is probably going to do the trick. 
Um, when it comes to chokes, obviously you're in, a, you're in a enclosed environment. I'd go with a full choke, uh, keep a nice tight pattern. You don't have to worry about really punching through. Uh, slugs, I'm always kind of hit or miss on. Um, the one because to me, one of the advantages of having a shotgun for a defensive situation is the fact that you don't have to be as accurate. You can create, you know, if it's 3 a.m., you're half asleep. You got a flashlight in one hand. You aren't going to be that accurate. And I'd rather have, say, the buckshot pattern out versus throwing a couple of solid slugs through my wall, potentially into my neighbor's house. Yeah. <laughs> Over penetration with slugs is a big problem. Oh, yeah, and my neighbor, but yeah. <laughs> and be, be aware. Just for the record, I'm an NRA recruiter, an NRA range safety officer, and my next door neighbor is the president of my state's largest anti gun organization. <laughs> It yeah, makes block have, parties fun. <laughs> you can have all the legal grounds to fire a weapon. Like, you know, the assailant is in your home with a butcher knife and an affidavit saying, I'm here to rape and murder you. <laughs> and if you used ammunition that, that, a, that a DA might say, oh, you, you should have considered, you, you over If you actually, you know, a round goes out your house and a slug, of, a slug will go through, you know, a brick wall, a cinder block wall or something. If you penetrate your neighbor's home or, God forbid, you hit someone else who was not the intended target, you can be prosecuted, especially for a negligent homicide or a manslaughter charge if they, someone tries to make the case that you should have known better, you shouldn't have used that ammo. Yeah, I got one point about that, too. I, uh I went to two homicide scenes over the course of a couple of years where there were shotguns involved. Um, one scene was a girl got taken out by a 12-gauge slug. That had already traveled through uh, one wall, hit her, passed through her, and went through like four other walls before it got stopped. Um, the other one that I went to some years later was a guy who took one shot of uh, birdshot in the chest, and that dropped him like a... I mean, it just, he went down like a sack of potatoes. Um, there was no penetration beyond his body. So, you know, uh, those were both one-stop shots, but uh, one went far beyond, and the other one just stopped right there. So, Yeah, and something else about ammo selection. We were discussing this in the green room earlier. Um, when choosing the ammo, you're going to either carry as a concealed weapon or keep in the house. Um, Basically, if you get yourself into a situation where you've had to defensively use your firearm and you were completely in the right, you're still going to get charged. Uh, they say it's going to cost you about 10 grand, usually, to get the whole thing taken care of. And what's going to happen is, without fail, you're going to get some DA who is going to portray the victim as an innocent crackhead just scavenging for televisions, and you as, you know, the right-wing, gun-loving, can't-wait-to-kill-a-human-being type of person. And one of the things that's come up in the past is people using, say, hand loads. People that are hand loaders do it because it's cheap or you can make your own batch ammo. They will try to play that as you are trying to develop the most lethal, painful, horrible thing possible. Yeah, hack your ammo, basically. Um, so one of the things I've done in the past is when trying to select defensive ammo, I ask the cops. Say, officer, what do you carry in your duty weapon? So in the event you ever have to use that, you know, what kind of what kind of rounds do you carry in your shotgun? What kind of rounds do you carry in your pistol? That way, in the event you ever get in one of these situations, your fallback could always be, well, why did you pick this evil pedaled hollow point tungsten core? It's what the cops carry. Mm -hmm. And kind of negates the argument at that point because you're trying to be safe. So. Yes, indeed. Um, can we stand up, too? I feel Actually, like I'm not quite seeing everyone. This, this, this gentleman is waiting a while as this one. Can we get one and then two? Uh, training as legal protections, specifically nonviolent crisis intervention, use first. Hmm? Why you anything at all? That sounds like a question for the lawyer. <laughs> repeat, repeat the question. Any kind, of, um, any kind of training is actually going to hold you to a higher standard. Believe it. Repeat the question. It, it, the question is: um, you, Is going to um, you getting training? Is that going to give you any kind of greater level of legal protection? Um, honestly, no. Uh, any kind of training is actually going to hold you to a higher standard, um, if nothing else. Uh, just because you know more, um, you know, uh, you you know better, essentially. Um, so, uh, so no. Yeah. There was a question here. Though it is required for your concealed carries, you know, so if you're going, well, in some states, in some states, 
Um, and definitely on the East Coast. How many people have concealed carry permits? You're, you've been very patient, sir. Yes. How does that change the legality of that weapon? Does that become just a very concealable, portable cell bag light? Or is it very. A telescopic flashlight? I would imagine once a baton, always a baton. So. Yeah, the question was, what if you top one of these telescoping batons with a, with a light? Is it just a very versatile flashlight? <laughs> no, once a baton, always a baton. Although, speaking of lights, those of you who, you know, who equip a home defense weapon, how many of you have a light mounted to it of any kind? And those who do not, how many would foresee flipping a light on in the middle of the night if you had to confront somebody, or would you, would you just try to seize the scene? Something to consider. I saw a hand that's been up over here a few times. Yes, sir. Um, what is the legality of changing the stock on a uh, rifle? The legality of changing stocks on a rifle or, or any weapon is probably good to mention yeah. here. Largely depends on the state you live in. Um, in some places, changing the stock out on a weapon might give it some of these evil features that go against certain state laws. Um, overall, like for example, if I was in California and I were to, you know, put a folding stock on a weapon, that would make it illegal because apparently folding stocks somehow make criminals more dangerous. Um, there are others, but at the same time though, where I live in the state of Washington, it's no big deal, provided that you still meet the federal overall length requirements. Uh, so if, for example, was it 26 inches or 28 inches for shotguns? Yeah, shotguns are 26 overall, but 18 on the barrel. Yeah. So yeah, if you if you cut your barrel down on a shotgun to like, and by the way, you never ask a smith to cut it down to 18 because the feds they have these horribly inaccurate rulers. I don't know where they buy them. Uh, 18 and a quarter, I would say, or even 18 and a half is probably yeah. you, you want to give yourself plenty of room. Just ask Randy Weaver. Yeah. But then, what if you suddenly say you switch out the pistol? You know, you put a pistol grip on the back of it. All of a sudden, whoops, you're under the limit. And do feds, do, do they measure diagonally? Do they measure this way? Well, no, they measure in whatever way is going to fuck you if that's what they're trying to do. <laughs> there was a hand. Uh, what suggestions do you have for making training more comfortable uh, when you're shooting up once around, keep your shoulders So the question about training and fatigue. Yeah, first off, yeah, mount the, mount the weapon proper. The, the question for everybody was reducing fatigue while training. Um, you know, sore shoulders, sore fingers, that kind of thing. Uh, first off, you know, use a weapon you're comfortable with. Um, you know, I know people that'll go out to the range with their, you know, 460 Weatherby Magnum. Um, yeah, you're not going to fire more than a couple of rounds out of that before you're done for the day. Um, there are pads and stuff you can get, like trap shooters have them, they go over your shoulder. Um, I don't recommend training with those because in the event you had to use your gun defensively, you're not going to put that on. Um, Mounting the weapon properly, having it up against your shoulder properly, uh, will reduce that. The other thing too is practice. Uh, when I first got into shooting some larger caliber rounds, I'd come home at the end of the day with purple shoulder. And now I'm at the point where you give it to me, I can fire it and not bruise. And that's because, you know, I'm holding the gun properly, but on top of that too, it's just it's the, your muscles eventually build up and you practice and it doesn't get as hurty. After a while, yeah, and don't drag it out into an all-day thing too, because mm -hmm. you're going to get fatigued, and as you get fatigued, you're going to become less accurate, and at that point, you're just you're throwing lead down range. You're not training. You're not practicing. Yeah, one of my friends who's actually here in the audience, we uh, recently found an, another range to go to one day, a nice outdoor range, but they had a policy of three-second lag between any firing, no matter what you're firing. They had this very strict rapid-fire policy, and we realized that we were getting just as good a training session in and not fatiguing ourselves and saving a ton of freaking money, because 45 is not cheap. And, uh, you know, yeah, you don't have to sit there and rapid fire your whole mag over and over and over. You can actually stop, break, pause each time, and you'll save your muscles and you'll save your, your wallet. A lot of hands. A lot of, I feel like I'm missing people in the wings. So um, there was this one. We'll go one, two, and then three. And then we'll get in the back. What 
What was the, the hypothetical you wanted? Oh, okay. So what, what would your response be if you were in, God forbid, a, a public mayhem or carnage situation and you were carrying? I'd confront. I consider it, if I've made the decision to carry a firearm, I consider it kind of my obligation at that point, okay. um, provided it's safe to do so. A good example would be the uh, Tacoma Mall shooting. There was an individual who worked at the cutlery store who had a concealed weapons permit, had a concealed weapon. He actually ended up taking three rounds from an AK-47 trying to draw the gunman's fire away from people, even though he had no intention of shooting because the, you know, at least like we say, you know, be aware of your target and what's beyond. Beyond, the, you know, beyond him was a wall. The gunman just fired at him. The gunman wouldn't have cared if there was innocence behind him anyways. In his case, he couldn't return fire because there was a whole mall full of people running for their lives, and he didn't want to miss the gunman and strike a civilian or an innocent person. And in that case, though, he still stood up and considered it his duty to try to protect, and he drew fire, effectively, allowing other people to escape. Sure. Female perspective on that would be. Um. There's a woman in Texas, uh, a very strong advocate for, um, for gun ownership, who tells a story about going to a local restaurant with her parents. The Lubbies and, Massacre. And she had, she had her gun in the car, and someone came in and just began random shooting. If she had, had been able to carry that gun on her, she would have shot the gunman. She, she had it. She couldn't go get it. She lost both of her parents. Um, I believe that if you are going to carry, you have an obligation to protect those who aren't. Um, yeah, she's a congresswoman now, I believe, right? Either at the state or federal level. She helped pass and reform uh, a lot of the carry laws in Texas. Senator? State. And perhaps the, the Virginia, um, the university shootings, might have, fewer people would have died. Maybe some would have, but fewer would. Any other comments on that hypothetical? All right. I actually, um, I'm sure some of you may have heard of the, uh, the shooting in Kansas City at the mall, and that's actually very, very close to, uh, to my home, and uh, got me kind of thinking about that uh, very issue. But what you have to realize, and it, it's, it's, it's just like when you decide that you do get that concealed carry permit, is the step that you're taking and the responsibility that you're taking on. Um, you know, getting involved is certainly raising something to a to a to a higher level, and and getting involved and seeing that something is going on, even if you are in the same mall and you hear that something is going on and you walk to that situation, you you, you got to realize that you're legally you you are treading on on a pretty fine line here, um, as far as as far as what that response is. You know, by you walking in that general direction, knowing that there is trouble. Is that more reasonable than simply walking away, whether you whether you have a weapon or not? Um, because you're probably going to be viewed as if um, a, as if you don't. I mean, by walking to that situation, that may be viewed as being unreasonable and you not acting in self-defense whenever you draw that weapon. Um, so you, so you, you really really have to. Uh, have to think through before you take any kind of actions in any kind of situation like that. Jurors, could you and Thorne and anyone else who would care to talk about your legal, what you should legally expect after you're ever in such a situation? Um, it, yeah, if, if you are ever involved in a shooting situation and the best thing you can do is a couple of different things. One, expect to be arrested. You will be arrested, you will be cuffed, you will probably be Mirandaized at some point. Um, the best thing I can tell you to do, even if you are absolutely 100% in the right, it was a mad junkie at 3 a.m. coming into your home and you were shooting protect your wife and kids, um, silence up. Demand to talk to an attorney. You have that right. And most of the time, the cops will understand what you're trying to do. You're trying to protect yourself legally. Um, demand to talk to a lawyer. If you have to make any statement at all, I would advise against it. But if you have to make any kind of statement at all, you feel you, that you should, say that you were in fear for your life or you're in fear for the life of other people, uh, whoever they might have been that you were defending. Um, 
the cops will understand this they know what's going on they know what the score is they have a job to do they are going to want to talk to you with your lawyer and i would advise you could make a statement after talking to your lawyer and working out that statement with your attorney but expect that to happen the other thing that's going to happen is initially if you're still standing there with a weapon expect the cops are not necessarily going to know you are the good guy in the situation they're going to walk in and there's someone lying there bleeding on the ground you're standing there with a gun they're going to be a bit excited okay they are going to be screaming you know drop the gun okay put the gun down at that point they are the ones taking control of the situation they're the ones taking control of the scene and at that point comply with everything like i said expect to be arrested you'll be cuffed you'll be stuffed in the car you'll be taken to the station at some point they'll mirandarize you investigators will come in and talk to you um, talk to your lawyer first that's the best thing i can tell you I would, uh, I would agree, um, to put it in the words of another uh, attorney that I worked for once a night in the banking never hurt anyone. Um, once, if you're involved in any kind of situation like this, you're, you're obviously going to uh, going to jail for at least, uh, you know, at least for that first evening. And um, I would say, you know, even, even no matter what, no matter how strongly you believe that, um, that you were in the right, no matter what, exercise your right to not speak, to not make a statement until you speak with your attorney. Get your attorney there as quickly as possible. Um, you know, you may be Mirandized at many different points, but the fact of the matter is we all know, we, we all know the Miranda warning. Um, so go ahead and exercise that right to, to not make a statement and, and, and until you have your attorney present. That way he can make sure um, the, that, that everything uh, going on to the record is, is, is the best possible because it is so much easier on the, from the legal side to deal with things um, uh, beforehand and, and not have statements on the record um, the, there it is to try and uh, uh, fix issues later on uh, no matter what and well a lot of hands I feel bad I feel that it's we're getting hard to manage who has which questions and I know we don't have crowd mics but could you kind of queue up in the aisles so we can get a get a feel for which order people are in and, and how we're doing on time we're still pretty good on time and we want to we want to get to everyone but come on up queue up kind of in the aisles if you have a question The gentleman just points out the psychological implications and the considerations in a snap. You, your body and your mind will know you're not at a range if you have to do this in real life. Is there any training or any other uh, tactics you would like to talk about that can help bridge the divide and uh, and not you know just you not know, just shooting at paper forever? Maybe IDPA yeah. things well, like that. Yeah. That actually something along those lines too is the habits when you go into that defensive situation, you are in reptile brain mode. You're going to do what you train. And I think one of the cases that I've heard brought up by a number of cops was an incident that occurred in the late 70s where individual uh, law enforcement officer, back when they all carried the uh, 38 revolvers, um, would go to the range, he'd set his little paper cup down, put five rounds down range, open the cylinder, knock the shells out, put them in the cup, load up, do that to save his brass. Uh, got into a situation where he actually got into a gunfight and ultimately got killed in the gunfight and what ended up happening was, is after he'd ripped five rounds out of his revolver, sat down, popped the cylinder open, put the rounds into his hand, rather than, you know, let him hit the ground, pop a speed loader in and get back into the game, he basically did what he did at the range. He popped them out into his hand, set them down, criminal shot him in the head. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, the CHP New Hall shooting. Yeah, because they had the officers collect their brass, so... Yes, sir. Gun, guns for females, um, wives, and girlfriends, etc. Take et them to your nearest range um, and rent a bunch of guns. Just rent a whole bunch of, of various pistols, revolvers, and let them try things of, of different calibers. Some of them they're going to love, some of them they're going to hate. Um, 
I got to try Laszlo, he's somewhere in the back here, I think, um, got to try his Kimber 1911, and that felt perfect in my hand. Mm -hmm. But then, then I tried um, Chris, Chris Miller's um, Glock, what was it? Is it? Glock, same caliber, a 45. And I, that gun scares me. That's, <laughs> that's too much weapon for me. Um, yeah. So what they they have to try it and they have to pick the one that's right for them. Our hands are different sizes. Um, body mass has you know, because what's going to throw you back, what isn't. The sights are different, and and the grips on on the pistols and the revolvers feel different. So you, so you have to have the one that fits your hand right. Do you have a caliber um, for my carry piece, forty caliber, um, Glock twenty three. Yeah, 40, 40 caliber was actually, yeah. unless I'm wrong, Noid, you'll know this in Thorn probably, wasn't 40 caliber designed specifically at the request of law enforcement who was equipping female officers and smaller uh, gentlemen officers who wanted it's a, something it's with It's a downloaded 10 millimeter. Yeah, something more than a Basically. 9, but not a 45. But uh, yeah, also as a range, as I, when I worked as a range officer, I used to see a lot of different types of people come up and shoot. And frequently what I noticed is when it came to girls in shooting is the guys that would take them out would either think it's funny to put the biggest gun they could yeah. find in their hands, so which I've never understood because that just guarantees that you're never going to get to go shooting again because she's not going to let you. Um, but on top of that, what ends up happening is it uh, seems like a lot of guys would come out that they wouldn't take the time to work with the girls and it was always this sort of, you know, I'll tell you what the right gun for you is. And it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way for guys. You know, there are some like uh, a friend of mine carries a SIG 232. Is that the 380? Yeah. Fucking hate that thing. Bites the hell out of my hand. He's spot on accurate with it. And it's like that for everybody. And just a lot of people don't realize that, yeah, if you're going to teach somebody how to shoot, don't expect to do a lot of shooting yourself that day. You're going to be working with them and let them try different things and different combinations until they find what fits them what they're comfortable with. Because if you're not comfortable with it, you're not going to practice with it. And if you have to use it defensively, you're not going to use it effectively. I, I've got one comment about that too. When I first got married, I was I was already an officer, and I took my wife to the range, and I started off with 22s because I didn't want to scare her with recoil and all that kind of stuff. She was very very accurate, even for a beginner at that point. Um, but she said she didn't prefer the really big guns because there was a lot of bang, a lot of recoil to control. And she didn't really real feel real comfortable firing those, but she did try them. Uh, a couple of years later, we've been married about five years, about 2 a.m., I was on duty, uh, still at the station. I was just actually getting through. And uh, someone tried to break into our house when she was in it with our son. Um, and I, I actually was the one responding to it. And I found her in the bedroom with my Dirty Harry 44 Magnum. Uh, yeah. I was like, all right. Yeah. And I asked her afterwards, I said, I, I didn't think she liked that. And she said, you know, fuck him. Uh, she was going to just blow away. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're, we're getting the five. So can we do like a, a one minute per with these five people? Think we can bang this out? Yep. Can I be married to what you do? Believe me if I purchase a firearm? Is there any way to address that? Take her shooting. Take her shooting. Take her plinking. Um, and if you not, can shoot yeah. cans and bottles. Just, um, no beer. Alcohol and firearms don't mix, people. Um, I've found the easiest way to turn an anti-gun person into a pro-gun person is to take them shooting. Mm -hmm. Take and them they shooting, still don't be gentle agree. with them. Yeah. You know, let them go interact with gun people because a lot of times people are anti-gun because they're scared of guns and they have this image in their head of, the you know, oh, I don't want to go to the range because to them that just sounds like, you know, guys, Wild West, fire and They show up and they suddenly realize, that, oh, these are decent folk. And they realize that, oh, I'm not the only girl here. Yes, that's... Yeah. And... Uh-huh. Interact with others. All right, that's the one minute. Do you have any female friends who shoot? Get them to go out with her? Yeah. Find a new girlfriend. Yeah, or find yeah. a new girlfriend. And freak? There's someone, there's someone who has dated a couple uh, fairly anti-gun anti girls. Stand it's up. not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> See, it just points out it's just not worth it. Okay, let's just not worth it okay let us knock these out. And freak. Direct your internet tube to the yellow pages. Yellow pages. Mm -hmm. Are you going to get shit for being a woman or a woman? They're made of cut glass. Um, they treat you like gold. You walk in and they're they're so pleased. You know how we welcome noobs as long as they, they don't 
They're not posers. Uh, posers? Yeah, it's like that in the gun world as well. <laughs> because remember, the more you try, the more you may buy. So they want you to be comfortable in A gun performed. range is exactly the same way. Um, if you just show an interest and, and you tell them, I don't know anything about this, but I feel li like I'd like to learn to shoot, they will suggest something for you to try or more than one thing for you to try. Our range um, allows you to swap guns. So you, you, pay, um, you pay one fee to, uh, to rent something and you buy your am ammunition. And then if, if you want to try something else of all the rentals that they have, and they have zillions, um, you just t bring that one back and swap it for something else. Yeah, a lot of ranges too have training available. Um, another yeah. resource too is um, NRA.org. Uh, find out who the NRA instructors are in your area and to be an NRA instructor you have to offer the full course book and they actually have a basic handgun course, they have a self-defense course, and they have a self-defense course specifically for women mm -hmm. that are new to shooting. Alright, we got two minutes. We'll get three people in two minutes and we blast, blast, blast. Go on. Hopefully easy question. Uh, for those of us who don't have an attorney on retainer, if you find yourself in this situation, especially if you happen to be out of state or something, how do you find an attorney? Getting an attorney if you don't already have one. Public defender. They'll they'll get one there real quick for you. Okay. That, that may not be the guy you're going to end up dealing with down the road, but initially you can submit a statement or whatever. He's the guy that will get you your magistrate hearing and potentially get yeah. you back out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and then what would you look for for finding someone? So you I'd call the local gun range yeah. and ask them if there's a gun-friendly lawyer. In fact, some of the ranges I've been to, some lawyers keep their cards out. They specialize in firearm-related. Yeah. So, yeah, find the local gun range, call up and say, hey, I'm in some shit. Who's the lawyer around here I need to call? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Training for house clearing. Um, well, uh, the NRA actually offers a defensive shotgun course and they offer the home defense course and that's one of the things they address is, okay, yeah, you want to go learn long range sniper shooting, you know, they got the long range rifle course for that. This is the course they're going to talk about wielding a shotgun 3 a.m. in your bathrobe, you know, over something that may be the cat or maybe somebody coming into the window. Um, I recommend that course and that's not just because I do a lot of work with the NRA. It's a good course. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of local ranges too. I've seen everything from kind of like combat, SWAT entry, house clearing type training you can take some places, uh, which incidentally is a whole lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> also all the way through, um, you know, all the way through the NRA basic course where they're like, yeah, you're not a SWAT guy, you're not a commando, the house clearing you're going to be doing is your house and hopefully it's going to be a situation where you end up having to present and the guy leaves. All right, we're, we're getting the light. Can you give us a real fast summary? What do you want? Um, just really briefly, can you go over uh, personal survival mindset? For example, if you're involved in an incident, there is a high likelihood of you getting shot. So to be able to keep in mind, you know, there's danger to the survival rate of people getting shot, and that if you get hit, don't just fall down and say, oh, God, I'm dead. Keep on the fight and keep going until you're protecting yourself, protecting your family. That sounds like a very in-depth psychological question, but we can actually, you know, there actually, is, a, sounds, sounds there is like another room across the hall. You answer your own question there, there, actually. It's, yeah. yeah. Come, come see us in the Q&A room. Uh, we don't always get to do firearm talks like this at DEF CON. It hasn't been in a while, so thank you so much for letting us come here. This was fun. Thank you, Las Vegas. Good night.